Thank you so much. And uh, actually, I'd like to start with a brief poll, non-representative. Um, you all have your field of uh, research. Uh, do you know the mathematical subject classification number of your field of research? So may I ask you, what is your classification number? Uh, 93 something? Sorry? 93? 93. So 90, so it's not on my list anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? Biology. Yeah. Biology, right, okay. How about you? Yeah, no, I don't remember the number. I'm doing uh, PDE and... Partial differential yeah. equations, okay. Uh, 35, that is, uh, right? So that's my number. <laughs> okay, okay. And uh, I know, I looked up yours. Yeah. Yours of five combinatorics. Yeah, something like okay. that. Does anyone know what the number 68 mean? Mathematics subject classification number 68? It's computer science. <laughs> <laughs> so computer science is a part of mathematics, as you know. <laughs> right? um, and that uh, suits me actually very well, because that's the kind of research I am doing. And that's what I like, really like about uh, my current course because my research involves equally computer science and mathematics. And so this course listed course also has seven students registered from math department and seven from computer science. And we're really bridging the two topics. So this is the kind of general picture. We have engineering and mathematics. And this is where I think most of numerics happens, right? Uh, the numerics, numerical calculations using computers, but not using computer science and even less using theoretical computer science, and that's where I try to fill in. Okay. So here let me recall for you the, what I repeatedly teach to my students are the five virtues of theoretical computer science, and you will soon notice that this is not really virtues of computer science. Uh, so this is Ada Lovelace representing the virtues, and here's the first virtue is specify, first specify the problem that you want to solve. What are the kind of inputs and what are the kind of outputs? Second virtue, specify the formal semantics of the algorithm, of the primitives that your algorithm will be permitted to use. I will give an example in just a minute. Then design the algorithm. Do not start coding, right? First design the algorithm or as uh, uh, Dijkstra said, Premature optimization is the root of all evil. So first design the algorithm and then analyze the algorithm with respect to correctness, that it works correctly for all the inputs that you specified previously and how fast it will run, like in the worst case or in the average case or in the smooth case. And finally, first virtue, prove that this algorithm you have devised is hopefully optimal in the sense that no other algorithm can solve the same problem more efficiently than the one you have just analyzed. And what I'd like to emphasize is that these are not really just virtues of theoretical computer science, but this is basically the essence of all of mathematics. Like in mathematics, you first, in a theorem, you first specify the hypothesis, right? That's like uh, problem specification. What does formal semantics correspond to? It corresponds to the axioms that you're uh, uh, supposing, like, for instance, or you talk about general rings or about uh, 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 factorial rings, right? That uh, corresponds to the second. Algorithm design that, uh, and analysis that corresponds to give a proof of a theorem and not just the claim of the theorem. And final, optimality. That is uh, usually by showing that none of the hypotheses of your theorem can be dropped without making the claim wrong. That corresponds to optimality, right? So what I'm saying is that co theoretical computer science is basically based on the same principles as mathematics. Now how about numerics? What I'd like to, is there some numerical scientists here? Don't mean to offend anyone, thank you. <laughs> <coughs> so no offense meant, but uh, uh, numerical <coughs> Uh, science uh, often violates at least one or two of these principles. So here's a quote from Peter Lynch from Cron Institute in New York. 
They said, over the years I have sat on many PhD qualifying exams. Um, uh, right. <laughs> of students whose work involves a significant amount of numerical computing. In one form or another, I invariably ask, how do you know that your answers are as accurate as you claim? After an initial blank or hostile stare, I usually get an answer like, I tested the method with some simple examples and it worked. I repeated the computation with several values of n and the results agreed up to three decimal places. Or more lamely, the answers looked like what I expected. <laughs> so, I used to be a physicist actually, and for physicists or generally for engineers, I think these answers are good enough. But for mathematicians, we have a higher expectation, I would say. So we're not really interested in what, in what uh, uh, numerical engineers call a method or a print, uh, a recipe, right? There's this famous book series on numerical recipes. What we want, as at least I as a theoretical computer science, I want algorithms. And what's the difference between an algorithm and a recipe or a method or a heuristic? The algorithm has these um, um, virtues, right? Full specification of the problem to be solved, rigorous analysis, and so on. So and that's where my research comes in. But some more motivation first. So what you see here is a disaster. Slide A was a combined accommodations, production, and processing offshore platform at the Sleipne East Guild in the Norwegian sector of the North Sea. It is known for its catastrophic failure on August 1991 due to a design flaw that resulted from an error caused by unconservative concrete codes and inaccurate finite element analysis modeling, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so the point is there was, this was designed using numerical engineering, but there was a mistake. Now we all make mistakes. And if you've ever written a program, then you have made many mistakes. I've never written a correct program, ever, right? But that's the point of uh, theoretical computer science, to help us write correct programs, to provide the tools, the methods, like with this virtues of specification, algorithm design, and methods of verification. And what I'm trying to do is to apply these methods, these tools, these concepts, to numeric numerical compute, uh, calculation. Why? Well, first in order to print such disasters, but also because of this close connection between mathematics and computer science. Now, a large part of computer science really depend on, rely on, and use mathematics, as you've seen from this error. But they, recently there has been come uh, emergent a converse error, namely, which is called the field of computer-assisted proofs. Purely mathematical claims are proven not by humans, but increasingly proven by computers, right? So that's a converse. Here's some examples. First famous example, the four color theorem, right? You all know that, discussion about that. Uh, Robin's conjecture, that's a conjecture about, or used to be a conjecture about certain axiomatizations of uh, Boolean algebras, and that these two axiomatizations were actually equivalent, was proven using computers. And now it's not a conjecture anymore. Uh, that's a little contribution of mine where I uh, solved a, a combinatorial problem in, in geometry using a distributed computer approach in six dimensions. Um, and you all know Rubik's, cu Rubik's Cube. So there's a famous example of an initial configuration of Rubik's Cube where necessarily it takes at least 20 phase moves uh, to to solve it, to get it to this uh, original position. And in 2010, people proved that actually any initial configuration can be brought back to the uh, initial state using at most 20 moves, using computers, right? These were all discrete problems, but ho how about continuous problems, problems involving continuous claims in pure mathematics? Uh, Merton's conjecture that was a, or is a strengthening of the Riemann hypothesis. So if that were true, then we had a proof of Riemann hypothesis. And as Odlitzko and Tehrile showed using computer calculations, actually 
the conjecture is wrong. I mean, who would have guessed that? But still, it was worth trying, and they disproved that, which is, although it's a continuous problem, using rigorous numerical calculations with interval arithmetic. Kepler conjecture hails, right? How do you stack oranges optimally? Like this. Can you prove it? Well, Hales could, right? Using numerical methods. Purely claim in pure mathematics. Existence of the Lorentz attractor. P uh, pure mathematical claim about a dynamical system proven uh, using numerical methods in the continuous realm. And finally, many, recently many claims of properties of solutions of partial differential equations were proven using rigorous computational methods. And for these all, of course, it's essential that the algorithms used in these calculations are algorithms, not methods, not heuristics, not recipes. So, but it's hard to really devise algorithms in numerics. Um, and let me illustrate that with a five example from for the five virtues that I mentioned before. So this is Donald Knuth, you know him, right? He's a mathematician, right? Right, okay. So, virtues of theoretical computer science in numerics, but they're basically also virtues of mathematics. And this is a, a, one of the journals that I usually publish in mathematical structures in computer science. So here's the first virtue, problem specification, second, formal semantics, third, algorithm design and analysis, correctness and efficiency, and proof of optimality. And we will see in the rest of this talk examples of these uh, virtues applied to numerical problems, case studies if you like. So how about problem specification in numerics? What you see here is a quote from the documentation of maybe the most famous numerical library from the numerical algorithms group. They have uh, devised many functions, for instance, for uh, calculating the minimum of a given function. So it's kind of a meta function. And this function, for instance, normally computes the sequence of x values which tend in the limit to a minimum of the given function f subject to given bounds. Right. And the things I've emphasized here, emphasis is from me, what does it mean to normally compute? Right? Is that, uh, for engineering, that's good enough in practice, right? But for a mathematician or for theoretical computer science, that's not a specification. You cannot really build mathematical computer proofs on such a specification, right? And the other thing that bothers me here is that it says in the limit, how fast does it converge? We don't know, right? So this is not suitable for rigorous error bounds in numerical calculations. And actually, well, let, let's try, let's try and what would you be your guess how to strengthen that specification to make it a kind of theorem about the functionality provided by this lab library. For which kinds of functions, capital F, would this uh, algorithm really yield, yield approximations to the, to the true minimum, to the point where the minimum is attained? Continuous functions, continuously differentiable functions, twice continuously differentiable functions, what would you guess? My point is, none of this suffices. There's a famous theorem by uh, a Swiss logician, Ernst Becker, who unfortunately passed away in 2012, who constructed a computable, continuous, and later refined to even a smooth function, C infinity, infinitely often differentiable, computable function that attains its minimum well, it's a continuous function, so it does attain its minimum. It attains in minu its minimum actually on many arguments, but on no computable arguments. So, any specification of this kind, there's a counterexample, and that's a counterexample to Specker, right? And it doesn't matter that this is an artificial counterexample. It is, definitely, right? But for mathematical specification, artificial counterexamples are still counterexamples, right? 
Next counter example, or my, <coughs> my favorite topic, is debunking myths in numerical science. Here's another one. Uh, Orevkov in 1963 uh, constructed, well, constructed, cr proved the existence of a computable continuous function from the unit cube back to the unit cube, which has no computable fixed point. Well, Brown's theorem says that it has a, comp uh, has a fixed point, right? It's a continuous function from convex set back to convex compact set back to itself. But it has, actually, this one has, again, many fixed points, but none of them turns out by construction to be computable. So again, probably we cannot have a, an algorithm that returns a fixed point of an arbitrary given uh, computable continuous function. And third counter example is due to Per Allen Richards from 1979, who construct, well, proved the existence of a computable continuous right-hand side to an ordinary differential equation, first order in one variable, uh, zero initial conditions such that, again, there are many solutions, right? Piano existence theorem says continuous right-hand side, so there must be a so solution. We don't suppose Lipschitz continuity, so the solution need not be unique, and actually there are many solutions, but again, probably none of them is computable, okay? So the least hypothesis we should impose when asking for computational sol solution to ordinary differential equations is Lipschitz continuity. And the final example, a contribution of myself, is about the spectral theorem, actually in finite dimensional case, just an ordinary um, uh, symmetric matrix, real matrix. It turns out that finding an eigenvector, not to even mention an eigenvector basis, is in general uncomputable, but it does become computable when given in addition to approximation to the entries of the symmetric matrix, also some discrete, it's called enrichment in logic, some discrete information, namely this integer, that's the number of distinct eigenvalues not counting multiplicity. Right? The number of eigenvalues counting multiplicity is of course the dimension of the matrix, right? But this is the number of distinct and this cannot be computed, but this is the information that is necessary and sufficient to compute an eigenvector basis. Which means like, and here I'm uh, back to computer science, this declaration of a function that claims to uh, diagonalize a given symmetric real matrix cannot be the declaration of a correct algorithm. But this one, good. Who knows C, plus, uh, C programming language, by the way? Okay, right? Great. <laughs> so this additional parameter, integer and a number of distinct eigenvalues, that makes a difference between computability and uncomputability. If this is absent, then certainly already from the declaration I can tell that this function cannot be correct in the rigorous sense that we're talking about. And the problem is actually degenerate matrices as numerical scientists will immediately agree. <coughs> so, now I've talked about computability, but I've not yet given you the definition of computability or for computation for real numbers and real functions. So here we go. Uh, actually, there are three natural notions for a real number to be called computable. And first notion says, that's a notion introduced by Alan Turing in 1963, if the real number has a decidable binary expansion. The decidable meaning, given a integer denoting a position of the binary expansion, tell me algorithmically whether the digit here is zero or one. That's a decision problem. And uh, many real num most real numbers are not uh, computable in this sense because there are uncountably many of them, but there are only countably many algorithms. For instance, the binary encoding of the halting problem is a kind of explicit uh, real number that is not computable. Another definition is the one that may be used uh, by uh, uh, numerical scientists, is namely we can approximate that real number up to arbitrary desired precision. Uh, that basically means 2 to the minus n basically means n correct binary digits after the binary point. Okay, that's like floating point numbers with arbitrary precision, not fixed precision. And the third definition is the one that uh, uh, Andrzej Grzegorczyk, a famous uh, uh, Polish logician, used. Maybe we can 
Turing machine can produce two, uh, three sequences. First is the sequence of numerators, second is the sequence of denumerators, and the third is the uh, unbounded sequence giving error bounds for the approximation of this, how this rational number approximates the real number that we want to approximate. All three of them are reasonable definitions and fortunately a theorem says that indeed they are equivalent. So that's already an indication that they are reasonable, right? If three completely different things are equal, then that makes sense, right? Like in complex function theory, uh, um, Cauchy integral, uh, no, I, I'm not going into that here, <laughs> sorry, anyway. There's another notion that uh, sometimes is used in numerical papers, namely that one can approximate that function by rational numbers like floating point numbers, but without error bound. And uh, the aforementioned Ernst Becker has proven that this is actually not equivalent and actually the difference is in the worst case as hard as solving the halting problem, undecidable. Meaning he constructed this famous Becker sequence which does convert, actually converts monotonically to a real number, but the speed of convergence cannot be bounded by any recursive function. It converges so slowly that one cannot uh, obtain computable error bounds to it. That's the point. If we could, that would help, could be used to solve the halting problem, which we probably cannot. Yeah, you see there's a lot of logic underlying my uh, research and uh, no coincidence because I had, as uh, Professor Om indicated, I had been a professor of applied logic in Germany for, uh, before. So that's about computability of real numbers and we're going to in the sequel focus on that notion, the kind of numerical one, and we'll use that also to define uh, one of several equivalent definitions to define computability of real functions. So this is den mean to denote a partial function. It is defined on a possibly proper subset of real numbers. And this means we will be talking about multi-valued function. Now what is a multi-valued function? That's an oxymoron, right? Um, I mean a function which not necessarily satisfies extensionality. Extensionality means, and again we're talking logic here, This is extensionality, right? And we're going to relax that uh, for reasons that will become clear in just a minute on the next slide. We're not going to require that. And this will be represented mathematically by a multi-valued function, or basically it's just a relation where the value f of x is a set, not just a single valued, multi-valuedness, okay? And now computing such a function by definition means to convert any sequence of numerators, in this sense here, an, that approximate a real argument x, convert into a corresponding sequence of numerators of uh, floating point numbers that approximate a value. Right? If it's a single valued function, an ordinary function, then there's exactly one uh, uh, f of x is a singleton. And that's supposed to be, sorry, that's supposed to be y, but in general there could be several choices of why that could be output. That's in computer science this is called search problem. Like for instance, given a, a symmetric real matrix, tell me some eigenvector, or tell me some eigenvector basis because in general there are many, right? As soon as the matrix is degenerate, there could be several eigenvector bases. Or fundamental theorem of algebra, given a money polynomial, tell me it's uh, complex roots, it's tuple of complex roots, including multiplicity, but in any order. We cannot impose any order on how the tuple of roots is returned. So in this sense, it's multivalued. So now is the first example where uh, formal semantics and correctness are an issue. And let me remind you of another result of Ernst Becker who proved that there exists a computable sequence of real numbers such that the following set is equal to the halting problem, the set of all indices where this sequence entry is non-zero. 
And what does that mean? It means what numerical scientists know all the, all the time since numerics 101 I've learned do not test for equality. Why should I not test for equality? Well, because because of rounding errors, right? Things that are mathematically should be equal, like mathematically these two should be equal, right? For real numbers. But in floating part arithmetic, they could be different due to, due to round of errors, which means that floating point numbers do not form a ring. They are very bad structure, algebraically speaking. So do not test for equality. But what can we do with real numbers then if we cannot test for equality? Can we test for inequality? Well, if we could test for inequality, then using the Boolean operations that could help us to recover equality using this method, right? So we cannot test for inequality either, right? So what is there left to do with real numbers, right? Um, can we mend that maybe by not using floating point numbers? Well, double precision is higher precision, but still the problem remains, right? Quadruple precision is no help. Actually, there is a way to avoid that for algebraic numbers. Algebraic numbers can be handled exactly as minimal polynomial, right? Together with a rational interval that in which the given algebraic number is the unique root of the polynomial we're considering. That's actually how uh, people like in, in LIDA, which is a library that supports such calculations on algebraic numbers. But as soon as we leave the realm of algebraic numbers and include transcendentals, there is no minimal polynomial anymore, right? Is there maybe some other representation of real numbers, transcendental numbers? No, there isn't. That's exactly what Speckel tells us here. If there were a representation that would allow us to test for equality, then that could be used to solve the halting problem. Okay? So it's really inherently to real number calculation. Now let's come back to this uh, test for equality and inequality. So every numerical scientist knows what is the semantics of the inequality. But when asked to really pinpoint the semantics, well, most of them lack the background in logic. And what I'm saying is that when you use a multi-valued semantics, a non-extensional semantics, it all becomes sound, it all becomes uh, consistent. Now, if you see that, you will immediately agree. It's trivial if you see it like the uh, Columbus egg. So here's the semantics. We have a, it's called soft test. We have a param integer parameter k. And the test x greater 0 with parameter k, k returns, tr returns true if the real number is greater than minus 2 to the minus k. And it returns false if the real number is less than 2 to the minus k. Now what's the problem here? It's not well defined, right? But that's exactly the essence of this non-extensionality. There's a small interval where either return value is permitted, true or false, depending on the internal representation of the real number, which we can get. And that's exactly the point of non-extensionality. The result may determine it de depend on the internal representation. If x is equal to y, but it's represented internally in a different way, maybe by a different sequence of approximations converging with error bound 2 to the minus n, then the result, the return value, could be different. And this cannot be avoided. And uh, this year, uh, with uh, Professor Müller from Germany and with my student Sevon here, and with Professor Preining from Geist, with uh, extended uh, Hoare style logic in order to prove the correctness of three multivalued example pro pro programs that use exactly this semantics. So that's my first uh, case study formal semantics in numerical calculation involving multivaluedness. 
Second case, study about the optimality of numerical algorithms. And I will return to the issue of des uh, design and analysis after that. So let us consider four typical operations in numerics. The first is the maximal operation. Given a, let's say, continuous or smooth function, calculate the maximum, or let's make it, that would be a functional, let's make an, op an operator, let's calculate the maximum up to given argument x. Right, so here's x, and we want to calculate the maximum up to x from 0, where x ranges between 0 and 1. So now it's an operator. Next example is the, uh, uh, the uh, Riemann integration operator. Uh, indefinite integration, so again it's an operator takes a, let's say, continuous function and returns a continuous function. Third is the uh, operator of solving an ordinary differential equation, and I've already strengthened here the hypothesis that the right-hand side is C1, and so in particular Lipschitz, and so in particular the solution is unique and actually computable, and only when we have seen that something is computable, then we can ask what is its computational complexity, right? And the fourth operator is the solution operator to a partial linear differential equation, namely Poisson's equation, which I'd like to remind you is uh, this with a Laplace operator here. And this is the inhomogeneity on the uh, unit ball. And boundary condition is zero. Okay. Here we have four operators. What is their computational complexity? It's not hard to see. So for the moment, let's fix a polynomial time computable continuous function and will later strengthen that to smooth function. What is the computational complexity of the maximum of that function, which is, as you recall, again a function? Turns out that this function can be computed in exponential time, but exponential time is of course bad. We want polynomial time. Now closer inspection yields that indeed it can be computed in polynomial time provided and here we're in computer science, provided that a millennium problem has a positive answer. That's not really helpful. But in the 80s, Harvey Friedman, famous logician, and his PhD student, Carrie Coe, proved, well, they provided another F. Here's the other F. Have you seen it? And that's actually pretty smart. They constructed explicitly well, explicitly as you can get, a uh, function which is polynomial time computable such that if the maximum of that parameterized maximum of that function were again polynomial time computable, that could be turned into an algorithm solving an NP-complete problem in polynomial time. Which means two things. First thing, it means numerical scientists can solve the P versus NP problem, right? Or the different perspective is, if you believe P is different from NP, then an exponential time algorithm is basically optimal in the worst case for this problem. Now what if the function under consider, okay, let me first, uh, right, that's the point. Um, if the function under consideration is not just continuous, but C1 or C2 or even C infinity, it doesn't help. The construction by Hart, Friedman and Co. actually is a C-infinity function, one explicit function. That's very different from most NP-complete problems in the discrete setting, you know, where we have entirely family of inputs. The problem there is in a family of graphs, right? Here it's one more or less explicit function, but on the other hand, of course, a function in on the real number can encode much, much data, infinitely many discrete information is encoded into there. Okay, and again, I will immediately admit that this count example is artificial, but I'm a mathematician. <laughs> I'm a computer scientist, and a count example is a count example, right? And uh, the infinity hypothesis does not exclude that count example. It turns out what does exclude the count example is the hypothesis that this function is analytic, local power series. So this small difference from C infinity to analytic, that makes really the complexity theoretic phase transition, which I'll speak about on the next slide. But first, uh, let us also cover the other operators. So the Riemann integration operator turns out, again, can be solved, can be computed in exponential time. 
It can be s computed in polynomial time if and only if we have a stronger hypothesis, namely that p equals r p. Now, maybe not all of you ha have heard of this class before, but the point is this, this is an even larger complexity class than n p. So this is technically an even harder problem. Now, how about solving ordinary differential equations? Riemann integration is, of course, a special case of solving ordinary differential equation, namely the case where the right-hand side does not depend on z, right? That's Riemann integration. So we expect the ordinary so uh, differential equation solution operator to be at least as hard as Riemann integration, and indeed this was proven surprisingly late in 2010 by the aforementioned professor did I mention him? Professor Kawamura, my collaboration partner, and we later strengthened that actually to see to see k right hand side for arbitrary but fixed k. Right? So again, smoothness does not really help in this worst case setting. P space is a complexity class even larger than sharp P. Right? So in a, this rigorous sense, indeed solving Ordinary differ differential equation is strictly harder than Riemann integration, provided that you believe, like most people, that p space is different from sharp p is different from n p is different from p. And finally, partial differential equation. We could prove that this is, in a similar sense, complete for this co complexity class sharp p. So it's in worst case a little bit easier than solving this uh, ordinary differential equation, but this is a linear partial differential equation, right? And the proof here has actually three claims that we prove. The first claim is three non-trivial ones. First is that when the right-hand side, the inhomogeneity, is actually polynomial time computable, then the solution is a classical twice continuously differentiable solution. Why is that non-trivial? Because there's a famous count example of a continuous right-hand side where the solution is not C2, right? But this additional hypothesis that, that the right-hand side is polynomial time computable induces uh, additional regularity from which we can conclude that the solution is indeed a classical one. Second claim is that if p equals sharp p, then that can be used to actually compute the solution. The solution we compute, or how we compute the solution, is by using the Green's function method. Now, Green's function has a singularity, right? And with a careful analysis, we can show that by uh, you know, like cutting out the singularity, on the one hand, we can do things still in polynomial time, propriated p is equal sharp p, and on the other hand, cutting it out does not introduce too much of an error, like a kind of a tail bound. And the third part is taking an arbitrary p space a problem, a pro no, sorry, taking an arbitrary problem in this class Sharpie, encoding it such into the solution and constructing a corresponding polynomial time right hand side such that the solution contains the solution uh, to this Sharpie problem encoded. So three steps. And this is, uh, will appear in mathematical structures in computer science. So this is about the case study about optimality of numerical algorithms. Many numerical problems are, in the worst case, hard. That's a message. But as I mentioned, there's this phase transition when the right-hand side is actually analytic, then in all of these four cases, the solution can again be computed in polynomial time. Right? Well, there's something happening in between, right? So from C1 to C2 and so on, nothing happens. C infinity, and then suddenly, the small step from C infinity to analytic, right? Something happens, and we've recently investigated that in further detail. Let me skip that. If, if we have time later, I can give you the proof how to encode any NP complete problem into computing the maximum of real function, right? But let me for now skip over that slide and uh, jump to the question on what happens in this phase transition. So this is a long animated slide, blah, 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 blah. And here we are. This is about algorithm design and analysis. So as I just pointed out, all these operators are 
in a sense, polynomial time computable on analytic functions, see on omega, but they are hard on smooth functions. Now what happens in between? To this end, recall this four-lane characterization and real analytic function on, let's say, the unit interval. That's just a smooth function where the uh, iterated derivatives satisfy a growth condition. That's a well-known characterization. It's basically uh, one direction is from yeah, just uh, uh, taking the uh, tail bounds from the uh, local power series expansion and the other is uh, taking the Taylor, uh, tail, tail error bound. So what you see here is this J factorial that's exactly from, from Taylor's theorem, right? J derivative and J factorial. And the other is the growth condition to the K times K to the J. So that's a characterization and that has been actually generalized 100 years ago, almost 100 years ago by Maurice Gebray. When studying solutions to partial differential equation, he introduced what is nowadays known as the Gevray hierarchy. And uh, on the elf level of Gevray hierarchy are those uh, smooth functions whose uh, iterated derivatives grow at most that far. The first term is the same, 2 to the k. Second term is also the same, k to the j. And the third term is now j to the j times l, where here we had j factorial. Now, let's ignore the k for a moment and consider the case l equals 1. What is then here? Then it says j to the j, right? And here it says j factorial. That's the same, right? That's Stirling's theorem. So indeed, the first level of Gevray hierarchy is exactly the real analytic function. How about the second level? Well, it's a proper uh, larger level and you all know a function which is on the second level. What is a function that is smooth but not analytic? First semester analysis. Here it is, qualifier. Exponential of uh, minus t squared divided by 1 over uh, um, 1 minus t squared. That's, here's the picture. Right? So it's a function with compact support, a smooth function with compact support. That's why it's used as a modifier. Right? And it cannot be analytic because if it were analytic then its tail expansion here, all derivatives vanish here, so its tail expansion would be equal to zero, but it's not obviously not zero. Right? And this is a function, as one can show, which lives on the second level of Gevray hi hierarchy. And similarly, one can construct functions that are in the third, but not in the several, second, and so on. So it's really a strict hierarchy. And it grows towards, but never really reaches all smooth functions, starting from analytic, growing up to the smooth functions. And what we could prove is the following complexity result of operations on this class or in this hierarchy of functions. The operations we consider are evaluation, given a function in some representation I'll mention later, and an argument, what is the value of that function and that argument. Addition, given two functions, return the representation for the sum of the two functions. Similar multiplication, differentiation, right? It's all smooth, so we can differentiate in non-trivial theorem says that the der der derivative of a function on the Lth level of the Gervais hierarchy is again on the Lth level. Same for integration and maximization. Well, the maximum of such a function is in general not a smooth function anymore, but anyway, just continues. And we could prove that the following operations on this Gervais hierarchy, on the Lth level of the Gervais hierarchy, and now we consider again this secondary parameter k, are computable in time, polynomial in n, the output precision, 2 to the minus n, plus k, secondary parameter, to the L, where L is the primary parameter of the hierarchy. So for L constant, when we're talking about analytic functions or second level, as long as we're on a fixed level, it's all polynomial. But when the level grows, the running time grows. 
and fifth virtue of computer science we could prove that this is actually optimal using a perturbation argument. So, to conclude, we have seen examples of uh, virtues in theoretical computer science, problem specification, maybe the spectral decomposition problem where it's really necessary to specify this additional integer parameter to make the problem even computable, right? namely the number of distinct eigenvalues of the matrix. If the matrix is non-degenerate, then this integer parameter is just equal to the matrix dimension. But as soon as the matrix becomes degenerate, two eigenvalues coincide, three eigenvalues coincide, two pairs of eigenvalues coincide, and many combinations. As soon as we have such degeneracies, this additional information is really necessary and sufficient to assert computability. Then formal semantics. We talked about this multivaluedness, and in particular the multivalued semantics of tests, which is a sound semantics with all these contradictions this, uh, uh, that the naive semantics imposes. The naive semantics, uh, one could recover equality using uh, tests for equal inequality, but with multivaluedness one cannot, and that's what makes it all uh, sound. Then we talked about correctness. And we verifying imperative multivalue computation using this generalization of Floyd Hoare logic. We talked about algorithm design and analysis, namely on the Gevray hierarchy, the benefit of smoothness. So from C1 to C2 and so on to C infinity, there's no worst case benefit in smoothness. But from C infinity on towards analytic, there is a benefit, and this is caused by Gevray's hierarchy. And finally, proof of optimality, namely uh, these four operators in analysis that we uh, considered helped us or allowed us to characterize purely discrete complexity class in terms of numerical problems, thus proving that these operators, at least without this res restriction to analytic function or any other uh, restriction, are kind of hard in the worst case. So that's it, perspectives. What we are trying to do right now is uh, a rigorous complexity theory of uh, other partial differential equations and the one I have in the back of my mind is actually the wave equation for reasons that I will expand on at the bottom of this slide. Um, canonical parameters and interface declarations, right? So I mentioned this uh, interface declaration for the uh, matrix diagonalization problem where we ne provably need this additional parameter and canonical parameters like the one in the Gevray hierarchy. Right? Then we've just started actually with uh, two interns from Seoul National University uh, computability investigations in shape optimization. Shape optimization is a hot topic in engineering, um, but mm, and it works surprisingly well. But mathematics and mathematicians only have started to really investigate what what engineers are doing. I mean that that happens all the time, right? Physicists have uh, have uh, devised quantum mechanics long before uh, John von Neumann gave it rigorous mathematical foundations, right? So that's nothing unusual, but here we're jumping in. Uh, in addition to the mathematicians, we also do computability investigations, and later, maybe in a few, uh, few years, we can also do complexity. So here's a picture illustrating the point in shaped op optimization. We try to get the same strength of a, like a bridge, but using less, less material. That's the engineering goal. Uh, I have this vision, but that's many years uh, ahead, of a fully specified and verified library of provably correct and optimal algorithms for ordinary and partial differential equation. That's just maybe more like a dream. Um, another dream is the actual computation of blocks and Landau constants. These are again constants in pure mathematics and actually in complex function theory whose value is not known any better than absolute uh, 1 over 32, which is 2 to the minus 5 binary digits. 
And there's a conjecture what their true value is. And if we could compute them with higher precision, that could help us reject, refute, although ne not to prove such a conjecture. But, I mean, this is a surprisingly large error, right? But no one has so far been able to calculate them more exactly. Maybe we can. And finally, there's an, in model theory, yeah, there's another Martin Ziegler, actually a very famous one in Freiburg. He's doing model theory and he started considering periods. Period is the difference of two volumes of semi-algebraic sets. And they form a ring, which is highly non-trivial. You can not just add two of them, but you can multiply two of them. Okay. And uh, yeah, actually calculating them could help us exhibit algebraic relations between different of them. So, and with that, I'm really done. Uh, is there another slide? No, that's it. Thank you very much.